Securing the Republic, 1790-1815, Chapter 8. When George Washington became President of the United States, he took his office in 1789 in the nation's temporary capital of New York City. And most of the political leaders in America believed that the Republican experiment's success depended on political harmony. They wanted to avoid organized political parties, which they saw as being divisive and disruptive. Yet, parties quickly formed, first in Congress, then they spread throughout the nation. The 1790s was a decade of intense partner, partner, partisanship and an age of passion. The survival of the Republic, the Revolution's legacy, and even American liberty seemed to be at stake. Now, President Washington embodied the national unity and the virtue of republicanism self-sacrifice. I mean, he retired as soon as the war was over from the army and returned to his home in Mount Vernon. And then he answered the call again of the public to serve his country. He chose John Adams as his running mate for vice president, who himself was an important political leader in the, during the revolution. And in his cabinet, he included Thomas Jefferson as secretary of state and Alexander Hamilton as the head of the new treasury department. He uh, appointed John Jay and made him Chief Justice of the newly formed Supreme Court. But we needed more than just leaders. We needed some kind of plan because we were a new nation. And the rest of the countries in the world, especially in Europe, uh, I mean, they looked at us, are we going to survive? Are we going to fail? Are we going to be able to pay our bills? But a financial plan proposed by Alexander Hamilton, well, to say that it disrupted free national unity uh, a little bit. But taking Great Britain as his model, Hamilton wanted to stabilize the nation's finances, garner the support of the powerful financiers, and foster economic development. He really wanted the United States to become a world military and commercial power. And he had some good ideas. I mean, the man, as I said in the Founding Fathers little video, uh, he was a bastard by birth. But he had a brain, and oh, he knew how to use it. He was really good at finances. They came up with six ways to make our nation viable. He proposed that one, we pay off at full face value all the national and state debts from the revolution. He wanted to create a new national debt by issuing an interest bearing bonds to government creditors. And the people who are going to buy these bonds are going to be the wealthy investors and of course, they're not in the business of losing money. They were going to support everything so they could make money. He wanted to establish a Bank of the United States modeled on the Bank of England. And this bank would act as the nation's financial agent. It would be a private corporation. And it would hold the government's money and make loans to the government and make profits for the stockholders. And to raise revenue, he proposed a tax on whiskey, which is going to cause some problems shortly. And in a report on manufacturers, Hamilton called for a tariff. He said, this way, if we can keep out the English, particularly the English goods, and give our fledgling industry a chance to survive, they wouldn't have to compete. And then he called for government subsidies to develop factories that would produce the United States goods, and then we can import them overseas, and we want them buy stuff and import it in. So the little YouTube I've got is coming up explaining this a little bit better uh, has four reasons, but there were six. And they're sound reasons. And although the American financiers and manufacturers and most merchants supported Hamilton's vision of a nation as a powerful commercial republic, there were those that had a different vision. Uh, his plans for close ties with Britain kind of set off alarm bells for James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. But they weren't looking toward Europe. They were looking westward to expand. That's the only way they figured you could have a prosperous republican future. Because they disliked urban growth and manufacturing. They didn't understand it. And they did not want an economic policy that catered to the bankers and business leaders, especially those in the North. They hoped America would become a republic of independent farmers who sold their goods to the world through free trade. And Jefferson and Madison both feared that a powerful central government, if allied with a growing class of commercial capitalists, well, it would endanger American freedom for every man, woman, and child. Of course, the initial opposition to Hamilton's program came from the South. They didn't have any investors down there, and the owners of government bonds didn't exist down there. And where support for manufacturing and a diversified economy was very weak, and most of the southern states had paid off much of their war debt. 
So they weren't having any part of this business with Hamilton. Hamilton argued that the Constitution's clause giving Congress the power to enact laws for the general welfare authorized his plans. But opponents, including the leader Thomas Jefferson, who was known as a strict constructionist or a strict constitutionalist, argued that the federal government could only use powers that were explicitly stated in the Constitution, in which he said the Constitution did not authorize a national bank. Well, Hamilton talked to Jefferson, knowing if he could get him to stop opposing his plans, the other states would fall into line. So they came up about a compromise. And Jefferson wrote in his diary later years that it was the worst deal he thought he'd ever made, but at the time it sounded like a good deal. He said, instead of having the capital be New York or Philadelphia, what if we move the capital to the South? The prestige of having the new United States capital in the South. And Jefferson bought it. So, in exchange for locating the new nation's capital, which wasn't built yet, uh, between Virginia and Maryland and calling it Washington, D.C., Jefferson got on board. Now, this is that little U2 I was telling you about. It's, it's, it's kind of cute. Today we're going to be learning about Alexander Hamilton, and more specifically, how he got his face on money. People back in Alexander Hamilton's time, they were pretty angry. You might ask them why. Well, first of all, the economy wasn't very good. There was a huge debt from the Revolutionary War. No one knew how to fix it. People were obviously very worried about their future. So they changed the government from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. Washington, as president, was really well liked. He was actually unanimously elected. However, even Washington knew that patience among the people would only last so long. Would this constitution fix the problems, or would it be the same old thing and maybe another rebellion, or possibly even another revolution? Washington was a great leader, and he knew when to ask his friends for help. One of his friends was named Alexander Hamilton, so Washington created a job for Hamilton called the Secretary of the Treasury. And Washington gave Hamilton, who was really smart with money, the job of how to, figuring out how to save the economy. Hamilton's first idea was to fix the national debt. He would fix that by adding more debt. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You might be looking like this right now. Well, Hamilton's plan was actually really smart. He was going to take the debt owed by each state and kind of put it all together with the national debt. Each state would be debt free. So their governments would be free to have more money to float around. And if all the debt was together, it could be paid back faster at a cheaper interest rate, which would save the country money. The only problem was that some states had already paid off all their debt. Most of these states were in the South, like North Carolina and Virginia. They did not think Hamilton's debt idea was a very good idea because they would have to pay more debt back than when they already had to pay their own debt back. They didn't think it was very fair for them. Of course, the two sides would eventually reach a compromise. Um, Hamilton's plan caused a lot of arguing between the North and the South for actually about six months. But eventually, the two sides made a deal. The South decided to vote for the debt plan. In exchange, the North would agree to move the national capital from the North. It was originally in New York, uh, moved down to Philadelphia, and the North gave the capital to the South. They agreed to move it to a place called Washington, D.C., which wasn't even built yet. So the construction of Washington, D.C. would happen, and then the capital would move into the south. And now you know why the capital is in Washington, D.C. So when we go there later this year, you can remember that I taught you that. The plan that Hamilton proposed with the debt worked out great. Now that America had decided to pay the debt back and they had a clear plan, other countries now had faith in America, and they invested in American businesses because they knew that they would be getting their money back. There were still more problems, though. Hamilton thought the country needed a national bank. This bank would be a place that would be a bank just for the government, and it would be a place where they could lend and borrow money and keep their money safe. The only problem was the Constitution. It didn't say anywhere in the Constitution that the government could make its own bank. However, um, there was a part of the Constitution that said that Congress could pass any laws that were necessary and proper, and Hamilton urged Congress to use that part of the Constitution to create the bank. Again, it caused a big debate, but in the end, the Congress decided that it was necessary and proper, and the bank was established for 20 years. There was one last part of the plan. Hamilton was a visionary. He really thought 
that America's future needed to change. And he looked at the way England ran its country, and he saw that in England they had these a lot of manufacturing, lots of big factories, and that's how the economy ran. In America, well, the factories here, they weren't so great. It looked more like a sheep in front of a water mill. So Hamilton wanted to improve American factories, and he proposed that in order to do this, the factories that did exist in America needed protection. So he wanted to put a tariff on all products that, the, that were coming into America, specifically the British products. He wanted to raise taxes on these products because it would cause American products to sell better because they wouldn't have any competition from the imports anymore. It would help factories and let them grow, and America be could become a more wealthy and powerful nation. And who wouldn't want that? Well, you might have guessed it. Again, the South. They didn't like any of Hamilton's plan. Uh, led by Thomas Jefferson, the South opposed the tax on British goods. Factory life was different, and they didn't really understand it. It went against their values of farming the land and working the land as part of your job. There's a picture of Jefferson. He was the one that led the Southern attack against Hamilton's plan. And the South also liked to buy fancy British products. So they didn't want to have to pay more for them when they were imported. The tax that Hamilton proposed never went through. It was the only part of his plan that didn't actually happen. And it started a, a real feud between the South, led by Jefferson. They would eventually call themselves the Democratic Republicans, versus the North, led by John Adams, who was a Federalist. These would be the first two political parties in America, and Hamilton's plan was one of the first things that divided the two groups. Hamilton wasn't around to see it because he died in a gun duel. Yes, back then, politicians really actually fired guns at each other. So to recap, Hamilton proposed fixing the debt problem by adding state debt to the national debt, and the South, in exchange, got the capital. That consolidated the debt and got it paid back quicker at a lower interest rate. Hamilton also proposed creating a national bank to lend, borrow, and store money. Was it legal? Well, maybe not, and that started a big debate between the two sides, but it did pass. And the last part of Hamilton's plan, which was the tariff, was blocked by the South, and the two opinions between the North and South really turned to those two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, later on. We'll learn about that in a few weeks. In the end, Hamilton's plan was a huge success. It got America on the right track financially and caused a lot of dollars to come rolling on in, and that is why Hamilton's face is on the $10 bill. Kind of cute and a little bit sophomoric if you want to know the truth, but in all honesty, it, it kind of says it in a simple way for you to understand. Well, the financial plan's approved and things are looking up, but then the French Revolution happened. And it deepened political divisions here in this country. At first, the Americans celebrated the re revolution because we thought it was inspired by our revolution. But the turn in the French Revolution in 1793 to a more radical, or what we call the terrorists, because they introduced something called Madame Guillotine. And President Washington declared neutrality immediately. He said our new nation doesn't have the resources to help either militarily or financially. Well, Jefferson was pro-revolution. He didn't believe the stories coming out of France about this new piece of equipment called the guillotine. And it caused a lot of friction between Washington and Jefferson. But most Americans thought the French hadn't been inspired by the American Revolution. And they just could not believe it, even when they heard that King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had been executed along with thousands of others. Anyone who didn't agree with the new French government lost their head. Once the execution became known to President Washington, uh, Hamilton and Washington and their supporters, they, they realized that this type of revolution invited anarchy. And one of the things that happened as a result of this, uh, part of the reason they had such a large revolution with the lower class is because of poverty. There was no money for the even people to even afford to buy bread. It, it was not a joke. They really didn't have any money at all. So one of the first things you're going to have to do in a new government is to fix the unemployment problem. And what's the best way to do that? Draft all the unemployed men into an army and send them out to fight a war. And if they are losing the war, they will, of course, be captured or killed. So that takes care of the unemployment problem. And if they happen to win, they'll get the booty from the country they defeated. So there again, they've got money. So the war took care of their unemployment problem for a while. But they did request our help. The problem was France had helped us, and we knew this, and we couldn't probably couldn't have done it without them. But we've been their allies since the revolution. 
But now President Washington wants to be neutral. He says, stay out of European affairs because France and England, and they're always at war over there. They sent over a French envoy named Edmund Guinet to try to gain support. Now, very briefly, I would like to have time to go into this, but I don't have a lot of time to spend on it. Uh, just stop and think the way the people were dressing in France at this particular time. Men were wearing high heel boots and very tight pants. They wore long sleeve blouses with lots of, I mean, excuse me, men don't wear blouses, they wear shirts. And long sleeve shirts with a lot of lace at the collar, open jacket over it. They wore fancy wigs and they wore rouge and lipstick. And the women's outfits were pretty much as risque. Well, as soon as Jefferson saw Mr. Guinea, Monsieur Guinea, he refused to see him. He did get in to see Washington, and Washington requested requested, probably not the right word, he invited him to leave the country. Guinea tried to recruit Americans to attack British vessels and to attack New Orleans. Because, see, the Spanish are still in New Orleans, and even though it's been forced, Spain has been forced to give back to France the Louisiana Territory, the Spanish government wants no part of it. Well, with Washington's refusal and request to leave the country, and Jefferson not wanting to see him, Adams wouldn't want any part of him either, he thought he was a dandy. He heard that there was a general out west in Kentucky who was very unhappy with the government, who was a brilliant leader by the name of General Mark Park, uh, Park, George Rogers Clark, and he contacted him and offered him a commission in the French army and several million francs if he would recruit an army and sail down the Mississippi and take New Orleans. Well, General Clark was just in the mood to do it, and Washington heard about it and sent a letter to the newly elected governor of the new state of Kentucky demanding that he forbid Clark from leaving the state. And the new governor wanted to tweak the president's nose, so he sent back a very formal reply saying that perhaps the president had forgotten that Kentucky was now a state, she was no longer a part of Virginia, and that Kentucky had her own constitution. And in their constitution, they guaranteed their citizens liberty. They had the freedom to leave the state if they wanted to and take their personal belongings. So if General Clark wished to leave the state and take his gun with him, there was nothing he could do to stop him. Well, Washington busted the paint off the walls and threatened to get up an army and come back and take over Kentucky. And meanwhile, the governor got hold of General Clark and said, not a good idea right now. Uh, I told the president that you had the right to leave, which you do, but getting an army to go down there, you're going to start a war between us and Spain, and Spain's allies, France, and we don't really need a war against France and Spain right now. So General Clark didn't go down the Mississippi River. So what happened to Monsieur Guinet? Well, he'd been sent over here to accomplish something, and he hadn't accomplished it, so he returned back to France. He was going to be introduced to Madame Guillotine. Well, he decided that wasn't the thing to do, so he heads back to New York, goes over into Pennsylvania, he uh, takes off his fancy dresses and puts on a local dress. He takes off his wig and washes his face and finds him a little fat German girl and marries her and spends the rest of his life as a farmer in Pennsylvania. Therein lies the tale of Monsieur Guinet. Well, the British are seizing American ships and impressing the sailors. John Jay negotiated a treaty in 1794 which canceled the American-French alliance and recognized the British commercial and navy as being supreme. And we were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because both the French and the English were stopping our ships. But this treaty with Jay, like I said, canceled the American and French alliance. At least we were not involved in the war and we couldn't trade again. And by the mid-1790s, the two political parties began to appear in Congress and they had names. They called themselves the Federalists and the Republicans. Both parties claimed the language of American liberty and each accused the other of conspiring to destroy the liberty of the people. Now the Federalists, led by Washington and his administration, favored Hamilton's economic plan and wanted ties with Britain. The well-to-do merchants and farmers and lawyers and established political leaders, especially in the North, they tended to support the Federalists. And in all honesty, they were a bit elitist. And they saw society as a fixed hierarchy in which political office should go to the wealthy, educated men who expected difference from their lesser men. They feared that the spirit of liberty generated by the revolution was degenerating into anarchy. 
and they were very much against the French Revolution. The Republicans, led by Jefferson and Madison, uh, seemed to embrace popular pop politics. They did support France, and they had a lot of faith in a democratic self-government. The southern planters and ordinary farmers around the country, and a lot of the urban artists, they sympathized with the French Revolution and supported this new party. And they were far more critical of social and economic inequality and more congenial to the broad democratic participation by ordinary Americans than the Federalists were. And both parties believed that the best, their best, they represented in the will of the people and, like I say, each is accusing the other. Meanwhile, armed frontier farmers in Pennsylvania tried to prevent the collection of the whiskey tax in 1794 and using revolutionary slogans and waving the liberty flag. Well, President Washington dispatched two groups to the region to suppress them. They offered no resistance, and the rebellion, it will it only reinforce the Federalist sphere of popular democracy. You can't let the common man have too much democracy. It was kind of a tempest in a teapot. But the part, part, partisanship of the 1790s, it kind of, well, it helped expand the public sphere and democratic content of American freedom. It increased the number of citizens who attended political events and read newspapers. And ordinary men who never before were active in politics, they began to write pamphlets and organize political meetings. These men called themselves the members of the Democratic Republicans, and they formed societies. That, well, they kind of came out of the Jacobin clubs of Paris. They openly supported the French Revolution and praised American and French liberty. Now, the Federalists thought they were illegitimate and that they were usurping the representative, representative authority of the government. Washington dismissed them as self-created societies. Now, the societies justified their existence by claiming that the people had a right to debate political questions and to organize to influence government policy. They truly believed that political liberty involved more than just voting and, and included popular organizing and, and pressure tactics. Although the societies soon disappeared, most of them were absorbed by the emerging Republican Party, but they also found some support among radical British immigrants who defended the French Revolution, such as Thomas Paine. But this democratic spirit of the 1790s invigorated the discussion of women's rights. In England, in 1792, Mary Wollstonecraft published a paper called The Vindication of the Rights of Women, in which she argued that rights should be extended to women. And she wasn't challenging the traditional gender role. She believed that women should be mothers and housewives and this type of thing, but she also thought that women should have greater access to education and perhaps a role and representation in the government. The expanding public sphere, again, offered opportunities for American women to participate in politics, not by running for election, no, not by voting. But there was a small but growing number of women who were publishing political and literary writings. They were published in the newspapers. One of these was a lady named Judith Sargent Murray, and you do not need to remember her name. She insisted that women should have equal access to education. She said if women seemed intellectually inferior to men, she argued it was because they were denied an opportunity to learn. So while women were not part of the body politic, so to speak, women were counted in determining representation in Congress. And nothing in the Constitution explicitly limited rights to men. And that was a document that almost all Americans assumed that politician, politics was an exclusively male sphere, uh, using the excuse that women don't have the emotional capacity. And George Washington was re-elected unanimously in 1792. But he decided to retire from public life in 1796. Things are not going well, and we've, we've got all kinds of things going on, and it makes him unhappy. So he set the precedent that the presidency should not be a lifelong office. And in his farewell address, Washington warns against policies and partisanship, and he urged the Americans to avoid Europe's power politics by refusing to embrace permanent alliances with Europe or with any other nation. The election of 1796 was the first contested presidential election. John Adams and Thomas Pitney of South Carolina ran for the Federalist side, and Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr of New York ran for the Republicans. And although Adams won the presidency with the most electoral votes, Jefferson received more votes than Pitney, so he became America's vice president. Now, Adams was brilliant, but he was disliked by almost everyone. 
even his supporters and his administration, and they face constant crisis. He looked like he'd been second on a lemon. Although we were neutral in the war between France and Britain, it, we were defending our right to trade with both nations by free trade. In 1797, uh, before negotiating the renewal of the French treaty with the United States, the French officials demanded bribes. Not just bribes, but we sent uh, officials over and they met representatives of the French government. We never did learn their name. They were called X, Y, and Z. They demanded personal loans. They demanded a bribe. They demanded an apology from Adams to see the leaders for the treaty talks. They even demanded a loan for their government. Well, when the Congress wanted to know why it's taken so long, Adams informed them, Congress and the public, and all of a sudden we're in a crazy war with France. And we had this rash of federalism support all of a sudden. And we, in effect, became an unofficial ally of England. You know, sometimes our government, with the best of intentions, does things that seem downright silly. Uh, every time we have a war, the government wants to protect her citizens. And to give you a perfect example of it, even in the 21st century, we have something called the Patriot Act in effect today. Well, back in 1789, the Federalist Congress decided to protect the citizens by passing a series of acts called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Number one, it was going to take 14 years to become a citizen. Number two, the president had the authority to deport any immigrant he deemed dangerous to society and American way of life. Number three, authorized persecution, prosecution of any assembly or publication critical of the government. Well, of course, the target of this was the Federalists were trying to suppress the Republican newspapers. Jefferson, talking about the Alien and Sedition Acts, referred to them as the Salem Witch Trials. He said, these particular acts are going to have a reign of witches. And more than a dozen individuals were charged with sedition. And many of them were actually convicted, including a man called Matthew Lyons, a Republican member of the Congress. Instead of squelching the opposition, the Alien and Sedition Acts provoked more of it by making an issue out of free speech. Madison and Jefferson drafted resolutions to be passed by the Virginia and Kentucky state legislatures. Both criticized the acts as a violation of the First Amendment in the Constitution. Now, the original draft of Jefferson's resolution asserted that states could unilaterally stop the enforcement of such laws within their borders. But the Kentucky legislature, being a fairly new one, and they've already tweaked the president enough, deleted this passage before its resolution. So while many Americans were repelled by the idea that the states could refuse to follow federal laws, most of the Americans believed the Alien and Sedition Act did violate protections for free speech enshrined in the Constitution. And it's the first time we're going to hear the word nullification. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> So the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were simply an effort to state to the federal government and they used the argument, we created the federal government, we should have a right to make some of the decisions. And the, the nullification, uh, this is going to be a word that's going to come up again and again over the next 70 years. But behind all this is going on, we have slavery. It's looking in the background and the debates in the 1790s. And as a matter of fact, Jefferson was only elected because he received all of the South's electoral votes, and he wouldn't have made it if they hadn't had that three-fifths slave clause. If it had been otherwise, Adams would have won and been re-elected. The first Congress even received petitions for the abolition of slavery, including one signed by Benjamin Franklin. But Madison and other political leaders, even though they found slavery distasteful, believed that it was too divisive an issue to be involved in national politics, so they just ignored the petitions. Meanwhile, the Haitian Revolution demonstrated how slavery shaped and warped American freedom. Jeffersonians, who celebrated the French Revolution as an advance for liberty, were horrified by the slave revolt in 1791 in Santo Domingo which happened to be France's most treasured colonial possession, an island of sugar plantations in the Caribbean. 
the slaves defeated British and French forces sent to suppress the rebellion and declared an independent nation in 1804. Now, how did this... See, but this time, in the 1800s, in early 1800s, Napoleon is in charge of, of uh, France. They, people who were having leader problems in France decided to contact the general to come to Paris to put down a revolt. And when Napoleon got to Paris, he didn't put down the revolt. He took over the government. His idea was he wanted to retake the area west of the Mississippi that we, he had, France had been forced to give up after the French and Indian War. And he was going to do it by sending troops to Haiti and then launching an invasion from there. But when it became apparent that he couldn't put down a revolt by slaves, because the well, it was just so far to resupply that there would be no way he could possibly retake that area. This is the young black man, Toulouse Laverture, who led the revolt. But now the revolt, well, the word spread, and it, it's kind of a universal appeal of freedom. It fostered hopes of freedom even among American slaves. But most of the whites in this country were terrified by the idea of armed slavery for insurrections. And they interpreted this turmoil in Haiti as a sign that blacks could not govern themselves. And Jefferson's administration hoped to isolate and destroy anything like that in this hemisphere. And then we start seeing slave revolts here. I am going to post a uh, document that's going to give you a lot of information about Gabriel and Gabriel's rebellion because he's a very interesting man. And I suggest strongly that you read it because there will definitely be a question, either a multiple choice or essay question about it. But just to generalize it, he was born in 1776 in Richmond, Virginia, on a tobacco plantation. He was trained as a child to be a blacksmith and semi-on, and we don't know how, but he managed to learn to read and write. And when things got pretty tight on the plantation, his owner let him go into town to be a self-hire slave. And we first really only heard it in 1799 when he stole a pig and got in a fight with the owner and bit off part of the owner's ear. He was sentenced to 39 lashes and had his thumb branded. And it's at the same time he begins planning a revolt. He wanted to have help, so he began to recruit other slaves. And he had heard of this successful rebellion in Haiti. And he had a brother named Solomon, and he helped. They began gathering uh, broken plowshares and things, to, and since they were blacksmiths, turning them into swords. He set the date as August the 30th in 1800. But time and tide, as they say, there was a rainstorm which delayed getting into town. And he was betrayed by some of his fellow conspirators. And it happens in every revolution, I mean, at every revolt that we have. You'll think you've got a hundred loyal people who want to revolt, and there'll be one who's scared to death. What if the revolt fails? If it fails, we're going to all be executed or whipped to death. And they get frightened, and they'll tell their owners what's going on. And this is pretty much what happened. Two of the supposed volunteers were slaves, house slaves, and they told their master what was going on. More than 30 slaves who were just happened to be in the wrong place got arrested. It didn't matter if they'd been involved or not. If they were black and not in, in the slave quarters, they got arrested. Gabriel escapes and goes to Norfolk. There he was betrayed by a slave and a free black for the reward. So he was brought back and he was tried, convicted, and hung on 10 October of 1800. That's not a... It just really doesn't do him justice. But like I said, the little document I'm going to post will. So what were the consequences? Well, the white slave owners became very, very watchful. The states expanded police and spy system. And, and Jefferson even used bribes to get his slaves to act as spies on each other. The black codes were tightened everywhere, especially the part about learning to read and write. And it became much more difficult to free a slave. If you did have a free slave, the free slaves had to leave the state by law. I know Virginia and Kentucky had the law that you had to leave if you were free. And, of course, it makes sense. Why would you want a free slave that close to your slaves that were not free? You might give them ideas. And, of course, Vassie and Turner, who are going to perform rebellions here in our country, heard of Gabriel and his dream of freedom. Being troubled by what's going on, the incumbent, President Adams, was convinced that the radicals 
within the Federal Party were waging war against what he called the spirit of 76. Jefferson is characterizing the Federalists as, I could say, a reign of witches and what's going on. But Jefferson was not alone in knowing or thinking that the election of 1800 was going to be critical. Because on one side, you had the Federalist, Alexander Hamilton, who had been George Washington's Secretary of Treasury. He believed that it was a contest to save the new nation from the bangs of President or Thomas Jefferson. Hamilton agreed with a fabulous news, Federalist newspaper that uh, argued defeat meant happiness, constitution, and laws were going to be in ruins. The Federalists and the Republicans appeared to agree on only one thing, that the victor in 1800 would set America's course for generations to come and perhaps forever. So only a quarter of a century after signing the Declaration of Independence, the first election of the new 19th century was carried out in an era of intensely emotional partisanship and people were also deeply divided over the scope of the government's authority. But it was the French Revolution that really caused a split and caused the partisanship to tighten up. So we had this election going on and the Constitution also stipulated that if the candidates tied on their uh, electoral vote count or none received a majority of electoral votes, the House of Representatives shall cause my ballot one of them for president. Now, unlike today, each party nominated two candidates for the presidency, and the one who got the most votes was president, and the second most would be vice president. Well, the Federalists had been out campaigning or caucusing, as they said, with, and they designated Adams in South Carolina's Charles Cockney Pickney as the party's choices. Adams desperately wanted to be reelected. He was eager to see the French crisis through to a satisfactory conclusion, and at age 55, he believed that a defeat would mean he would be sent home to Quincy, Massachusetts, to die in obscurity. Now, Pinckney, born to the Southern aristocracy, was also raised in England. But in those days, as I said, the Constitution left the manner of selecting a presidential elector to the states. Now, this is confusing. In 11 of the 16 states, the state legislator picked the electors. Therefore, the party that was in control would make sure that they chose electors and voted like they wanted to. In the other five states, electors were chosen by qualified white male voters. And there was a couple of states that used a winner-take-all system. Voters cast their ballots for the entire slate of one party or the other. Now, presidential candidates did not kiss babies. They did not ride in parades. They did not shake hands. They didn't even go out and make stump speeches. They remained above the fray, you know. They left campaigning to their surrogates, particularly the elected officials in their party. So Adams and Jefferson each returned home from Congress, which adjourned in May, and neither left their home until they would return to the new capital of Washington in November. But for all its differences, much about the campaign of 1800 was recognized, recognized to be modern. But the contest was played out largely in the print media the unsparing personal attacks on the character of the, each other's nominee was <laughs> it would make some of our candidates today blush. Adams was portrayed as a monarchist who had turned his back on republicanism. He was called senile, a poor judge of character, vain, jealous, and driven by an ungovernable temper. Pickney, Pickney uh, was labeled as a mediocre man who was limited talent and he was very ill-suited to the exalted position of vice president. Well, Jefferson didn't escape unscathed either. He was accused of being a coward. Not only said the critics had he lived in luxury at Monticello while the others sacrificed during the War of Independence, but he had fled like a jackrabbit when the British soldiers raided Charlottesville in 1781, and he had failed egregiously as Virginia's governor, demonstrating that his nerves are too weak to bear the anxiety and difficulties of the presidency. Federalists further insisted Jefferson had been transformed into a dangerous radical during his residence in France and was a howling atheist. For his part, Burr was depicted as a man without principles, a man who would do anything to get his hands on power. So Jefferson and Burr had each received 73 electoral votes. Adams got 65 and Pickney got 64. So the House of Representatives would have to make the final decision between the two Republicans. And although Jefferson and Burr had tied the Electoral College, public opinion really seemed to be on the side of Jefferson. He was better known. And not only had he the choice, was he the choice of the party's nominating committee, but he had also served longer at a national level than Burr and in a much more exalted capacity. 
But if neither man were selected by noon of March the 4th, when Adam's term officially ended, the country would be without a chief executive until the newly elected Congress convened again in December, nine months later. And in the interim, the Federalist-dominated Congress would be in control. Wednesday, February the 11th, the day the House was to start their balloting. And by Saturday, three days later, the House had cast 33 ballots, tie after tie after tie. Shake and Adams was certain that the two sides had come to the preface of disaster and that a civil war was expected any time. And there was talk that Virginia would secede the nation if Jefferson was not elected. Then a rumor floated around that a mob had stormed the arsenal in Philadelphia and was preparing to march on Washington to drive the defeated Federalists from power. Well, fortunately, we have some people who had a little sense, and we know that we can't go on like this. And after Saturday's final ballot, it was a representative of the uh, electoral voter from Delaware, whose name was Bayard, who blinked. The following day, February the 17th, the House gathered at noon to cast its 36th ballot, and it turned out by one vote, Jefferson won because nobody had changed their mind. Bayard had abstained. So Jefferson became president by one vote. And this just shows you the breakdown. As you can see, uh, the Federalists are being kind of pigeonholed in the Northeast. This will give you just a little bit more information about the election. Let me now warn you in the most solemn manner against the painful effects of the spirit of party. The ultimate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge natural to party dissension, is itself a frightful despotism. Despite George Washington's dire warning, two distinct political parties were discernible by the end of the 18th century. The Federalists emerged from a coalition that had fought for ratification of the Constitution in 1788. They were bound by a commitment to an energetic federal government. Washington was, by inclination, a Federalist, yet clear divisions over economic and foreign policy surfaced within his administration. Jefferson frequently opposed Federalist initiatives and eventually resigned as Secretary of State, complaining that he and Hamilton had been pitted against each other every day in the cabinet like two fighting cocks. James Madison joined Jefferson in leading the opposition Republican Party. The Federalist notion of the relation between the government and the people was that the people voted and then the people shut up and they let their officials carry on all the business of government. The Jeffersonian idea was that the government was servants of the people and the citizens should be actively involved all the time. By the election of 1800, the two parties were openly promoting different platforms. John Adams and Charles C. Pinckney ran for the Federalist Party. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr ran as Republicans. The Jeffersonian Party is the first party to recognize that it has to um, regard party behavior seriously and mobilize voters um, at, at the state level um, and to regard the election as a kind of contest um, in which um, what we would now regard as modern political organizing is necessary. The Federalists don't understand that. Um, the Federalists think that they just have to present their candidates um, and the, the people will naturally gravitate towards them. Federalists remain more deferential and more uh, classical in their notions about what politics is supposed to be. In the election of 1800, the Republicans better reflected the anti-elitist spirit of the times. When all of the votes were in, the two Republican candidates were locked in a tie for the presidency. They ended up with a tie vote because party discipline was so excellent, the Republicans were so well organized, everybody voted for the two men. Now the Constitution had arranged that the winner and the runner-up would become president and vice president respectively. The Constitution also said there wasn't a winner, uh, that the vote was thrown into Congress, so thrown into the House. 
then came the possibility of denying Jefferson the vote. And the Federalists, there were enough Federalist spoilers that would love to have done that. To Alexander Hamilton quit it. He was the one who squashed that. He didn't like Jefferson, but he regressed it further. And so it didn't happen. And Jefferson was elected on the 37th of April, and I found it was clear uh, then that the Constitution had not foreseen the development of parties. And so I uh, think the Constitutional Amendment was proposed and passed very quickly, which set up separate elections for the president. The big significance of the election of 1800, though, is that it's the first time when political power changes from one regime to another. 1800 is the first occasion when an opposition party, a new group, replaces the old group. By the creation of political parties, the United States effectively creates a way to discipline and structure and internalize conflict and to create a situation in which different points of view can coexist without one side annihilating, massacring, executing the other side. The United States, in effect, internalizes a permanent dissent with the creation of political parties. What's significant is what doesn't happen. Jefferson wins the election. The Federalists are truly horrified. They think that he's a very dangerous man, but they don't take any action. They don't rattle any swords. They don't talk about secession. They just go home and grumble. Power is transferred peacefully. And we can measure the, the real significance of that by the number of times in world history in which groups of people in power have not given up that power when they've been voted out of office. And they've overthrown the government. They've overthrown the Constitution. You cannot have democratic politics unless the people who are participants in politics are willing to abide by the decisions of the ballot box. Jefferson's inaugural address was conciliatory. Every difference of opinion is not a difference in principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. However, in a private letter of the same period, Jefferson wrote, I shall, by the establishment of Republican principles, sink federalism into an abyss from which there shall be no resurrection. This is very, very short, and it's just a demonstration of, well, some of the um, accusations back and forth between Jefferson and Adams. It might make some of our modern politicians blush, as I said. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with cries. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames? Female chastity violated? Children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message. Because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. <laughs> uh, no, didn't I tell you? It's uh, hard to believe that our founding fathers, and like I told you in the founding fathers' little video, uh, these were men 
<laughs> and this just demonstrated that they were not always the best of men. Now, after seven contentious days in the long electoral battle, uh, the election was won by one vote and there was allegations of a deal. And Jefferson, when he became president, kind of led some type of credence to these allegations because he'd been fighting Hamilton, you know, for decades uh, against this economic system. But once he was in office, he left the Bank of the United States in place. He continued allowing federal government to borrow. He did not remove most federal office holders, and he acquiesced to the entire financial system. So the mystery is... <laughs> Why would Jefferson not deny, would he deny making some kind of a deal? But he did. But another mystery is of the election of 1800 is would Jefferson and his backers have actually sanctioned violence had they been denied the presidency? But soon after taking office, Jefferson began claiming that there was no deal struck. And at his inauguration, he pledges, and I've got 11 things here, uh, he wanted to conciliate his Federalist opponents by claiming that both parties shared the same principles, even if they disagreed in their opinions. And Jefferson vowed to reduce the government. He wanted free trade. He wanted to ensure freedom of religion and the press. He wanted to avoid any entanglement alliances with any of the other nations. He did try to dismantle much of the Federalist ways of doing things and, and prevent the kind of centralized state the Federalists had promoted. He did pardon those jailed under the Sedition Acts and he reduced the Army and the Navy and the number of government employees. He abolished all taxes except for tariff and paid off part of the national debt. Despite his wishes, the Supreme Court under Chief Justice John Marshall, an appointee by Adams and a Federalist, it increased its power during his administration and he did everything he could to try to get rid of him. And one interesting case is he uh, ends up trying Aaron Burr, his vice president, after he leaves office for treason. It's called the Spanish Conspiracy Theory, but uh, it involves history of another state in the Mississippi River, which we won't get into. But Chief Justice John Marshall, uh, in his decision, the Mayberry versus Madison in 1803, uh, the Marshall Court, as it was called, established the right of the Supreme Court to determine whether an act of Congress violates the Constitution. This became known as a judicial review. He also established the right of the nation's highest court to determine the constitutionality of state laws, which really ticked off the states. But Jefferson saw the Louisiana Purchase as his greatest achievement, and yet he, you know, it, it's, it gives you another look at his character. Uh, France had forced Spain to give back the vast Louisiana Territory in 1800, and per was purchased by Jefferson for the very small sum of 15 million. But like I said, it was sold because Napoleon was angry when the representatives got there because of the Haitian Revolution, and he realized he was never going to be able to do it, and he needed the money. Uh, he was fighting another war in Europe and he needed funds for those campaigns. And sadly, said, the transportation line was way too long. But as you can see, the Louisiana Purchase doesn't cover all of it. It's just like the heart of the country. Like the Napoleon was angry. So when the uh, emissaries arrived from the U.S. to make nice, uh, he said, well, the Empire Port. The problem was the Federalists in the Northeast opposed. It was blatantly unconstitutional. There was nothing in the Constitution that said that the United States could purchase land, and the area was not unoccupied. But the good of the purchase had doubled the U.S. size. It didn't have any problem we had with the Port of New Orleans once we managed to convince the Spanish governor that we were taken over, and there was more land open for settlement. Just a fancy, pretty picture of what New Orleans was supposed to look like at the time of the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson then sends Lewis and Clark to explore this area. He wanted them to, he gave them a list of five, well, it should be four things, not five things. Construct a scientific survey of everything that was out there, establish the area's resources. We had no idea what was out there. Establish trade or make nice with the Indians that you find and find that elusive water route to the Pacific, the elusive Northwest Passage. Those were the orders they were given. And New Orleans, like I said, once we convinced the Spanish governor that we were going to take over, you first it was French, then it was Spanish, then it was French, and you've got all those people coming in from the Caribbean. 
up in the different nations and the blacks and, and the slaves and the free and there's so many different cultures and traditions and if you've never been to New Orleans especially in the old quarter the French Quarter it's a beautiful city uh, it was more beautiful before Katrina but uh, there are certain areas that are still maintain the mystique and the history of the 17 and 1800s and slaves had some rights there but like I said the Spanish governor did not want to turn over control we had to convince him and here again oh dear come on behave yourself they left from St. Louis went all the way oops my fingers heavy tonight to Ford Clap Stop where they stopped and this part in here is claimed by Spain Great Britain the United States and even Russia is having some coming down this way so we actually the boundaries were never really set that much in stone and this this is what just amazes me that these men I mean it's almost like a picture it's so good now this is a very brief video and it's really more pretty than it is informative but here we go In 1803, Frederick Thomas Jefferson set to start his visiting new territory from Napoleon Bonaparte, the leader of France. Desperate for funds, Napoleon offered to sell the territory to the United States for $15 million. In what has been called the best purchase in the history of the United States, Jefferson agreed to the price. The Louisiana Territory doubled the current size of the United States, and today the territory makes up all or part of 14 states. Unsure of the bounds of the territory and interested in finding the elusive Northwest Passage, Jefferson selected his aide and friend, Meriwether Lewis, to explore the region. Lewis chose his former Army Captain, William Clark, as his co-captain on the voyage. The voyage was named the Corps of Discovery and was given three goals by Jefferson. First, and most importantly, to discover the Northwest Passage, an all-water route from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Second, the explorers were to document the geography and animal and plant life they saw. Third, they were to meet the Native American tribes and extend to them the full fellowship of the United States. The Corps left from St. Louis, Missouri in May of 1804. They traveled on water wherever possible and wintered in present-day North Dakota with the Mandan Native Americans. The help of the Mandan Native Americans was invaluable to the Corps of Discovery. During the winter, Lewis and Clark were introduced to Toussaint Charbonneau, a French Canadian fur trapper, and his wife, a Shoshone woman named Sacagawea. Charbonneau and his wife were invited to be a part of the expedition, as Sacagawea could serve as a useful interpreter for the Corps. A few months after they met, Sacagawea gave birth to a boy named John Baptiste. Clark and the other members of the expedition nicknamed him Little Bomb. From the Mandan Native Americans, the expedition traveled west. The terrain became more rugged and there became fewer navigable rivers to traverse the area. Upon meeting with the Shoshone Native Americans, Lewis and Clark attempted to negotiate for horses to carry them across the Rocky Mountains. As leader of the Shoshone tribe, Chief Kemmelin was reluctant to help the Corps until he met Sacagawea. When she was young, Sacagawea had been kidnapped from her people and sold to Charbonneau, who later married her. When Sacagawea was called upon to help interpret for Lewis and Clark, she realized that Chief Camelway was her brother. Because of this discovery, the Corps was able to obtain the horses and supplies they would need to cross the Rocky Mountains and reach the Oregon coast. From the Shoshone tribes in northern Idaho, Lewis and Clark were able to ride the rivers through northern Oregon and reach the Pacific Ocean. Ocean in view. Oh, the joy. Lewis and Clark wintered in a fort that they had built named Fort Clatsop. When spring came, the Corps began their long journey home. Although they did not discover the Northwest Passage, the Corps of Discovery successfully completed their other objectives. They created good relationships with the Native American tribes that they encountered. 
They accurately mapped the region that they traveled, creating approximately 140 maps of the territory. They also documented and discovered over 100 species of animals and approximately 176 plant species. The expedition even sent a caged prairie dog to Thomas Jefferson, as the animals had never been seen in the East before. From the wide and flowing Mississippi to the mossy trails in Oregon, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark had traversed the country, ending their journey after two years, four months, and ten days. If you ever get a chance, there is a, uh, I think it's a film, I know there's several books written about the death of Meriwether Lewis. Was he murdered? Did he commit suicide? Or what happened to him? He was killed in the wilderness of the South. Very interesting. A little side note. Now, incorporating Louisiana, especially the city of New Orleans with the problems with the governor, seemed to be not go easy, but this purchase of Louisiana, it showed that despite being far removed from Europe, events across the Atlantic would affect the United States, primarily because the United States depended on many goods, especially manufactured goods, from Europe. And the wars that they had in Europe, especially between Europe and, I mean, France and England and Spain, directly influenced Americans' livelihoods. And where Jefferson hoped to avoid having entangled in them, ultimately he could not ignore some of them. He wanted a limited state, but he didn't seem to mind using the federal military to fight the nation's first war, a war to protect commerce in the Mediterranean. It's called the Barbary Wars. Now, I have a brief YouTube in uh, post chapter seven slides. It's seven minutes long, and it'll tell you all about the Barbary Wars in much more detail than we go into right here. Uh, it basically, it was pirates from the Barbary states. And these states were along the uh, northern coast of Africa on the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And we had been protected by the English as long as we were under the English protection. But once the revolution happened and we were no longer had the English to protect us, we became prey. When Jefferson refused demands that the United States increase its tribute, a war between the Barbary states and the United States started last in 1804. And the treaty ending that war ensured the freedom to ship freely in the Mediterranean and nearby Atlantic Ocean. But you will learn when you see the YouTube that Washington authorized use to pay. He said we didn't have the Navy, which we didn't have. You know, half a dozen ships wasn't going to protect us. Uh, so not only we paid, but England paid, everybody paid to keep from having to go to war. I mean, it was just the way you did business. But finally, Jefferson said no. He declared war and the American Navy was born because we had to start building ships to fight the war. Although it's going to be Madison that finishes it. Meanwhile, back up a year or two, France and England are at it again. Each nation is imposing a blockade and trying to deny it any trade with the United States, which we were officially neutral. The British also began to engage in the impressment of American sailors or kidnapping them for service in the Royal Navy. And Jefferson, believing Americans' economy required free trade, enacted something called the Embargo, which prohibited all American vessels from sailing to foreign ports to try to force an end to the uh, blockade. Well, it stopped all American exports and <laughs> devastated our nation's ports, but it didn't persuade France or Great Britain to end their blockade. In 1809, Jefferson signed the Non-Intercourse Act, which banned trade only with Britain and France, and promised a resumption of trade with either nation if it ended its ban on American shipping. In 1808, Jefferson's successor, James Madison, easily won election as president, and with the embargo of failure and very, very unpopular. In 1810, Madison forged a new policy in which trade was resumed with both powers, which provided that if either France or Britain stopped interfering with American shipping, the United States would impose an embargo if they didn't hold, keep to their word. France ended its blockade, and the British increased their attacks on American ships and sailors. In 1812, Madison resumed the embargo against Britain. Now, we had some young congressmen from the West known as War Hawks. The leaders were Henry Clay of Kentucky and John Calhoun of South Carolina. They're calling for war. Number one, it's going to be an opportunity to conquer Florida and maybe even take Canada. 
and others wanted a war to defend the principles of free trade and end Europe's power over America. Well, deteriorating relations with the Indians in the West also precipitated the war. Under President Jefferson, the government continued efforts to, quote, civilize, unquote, the Indians, even while it made efforts to forcibly remove them from their lands. We had to open up this land. The white settlers want it. So Indians in the Western Territories acquired through the Louisiana Purchase were greatly outnumbered by whites. And some tribes, particularly the Creeks and the Cherokee, they began to adopt white man's ways, such as agriculture and, and slavery. You know, that's real civilized. Others, called nativists, wanted to end European influence and resist any white settlement of their lands. So in the dozen years before 1812, movements of prophecy and cultural revitalization swept Western and Southern tribes. They began calling on the Indians to stop the white man's destructive practices, such as gambling and drinking. But a more militant position was taken by two Shawnee brothers. To come see in, okay, Tenskawatawa. He was also called a prophet, which is what I'm going to call him. They refused to sign treaties with whites, and they were advocating resistance to the federal government. And the prophet argued that whites were the source of all evil, and that Indians should completely separate from everything European. In 1810, Tecumseh organized attacks on frontier settlements. In 1811, a general by the name of William Henry Harrison destroyed the militant's village at the something called the Battle of Tippecanoe. Now, this battle, Harrison and Tecumseh had been talking, and they kind of respected each other. And Tecumseh, when he realized that the general was getting ready to push, said, "Can we have kind of a treaty? I mean, kind of a you know." Let's just sit here for a while and let me go talk to some of the other Indian leaders and see if maybe we can't work something out. And Harrison agreed. But meanwhile, while the Tecumseh was gone, he ordered his men to surround the village called Prophet Town. Well, the Indians wake up one morning and they see they're surrounded by bluebellies. So they don't wait. They attacked the military in the next morning early. And it's at this battle that we uh, lost an awful lot of Kentuckians. Awful lot. As a matter of fact, most of Western Kentucky, every county and town, is named after someone who died in that battle. The Battle of Tippecanoe is called the first battle of the War of 1812, although war has not been declared yet. Madison asked Congress to declare war in Britain in 1812, although he didn't really want to. And the vote showed a very divided nation. Federalists and Republicans representing the northern states were merchants and financial interests were concentrated, they voted against the war. But the Southern and Western representatives voted overwhelmingly for war. So the U.S. is deeply divided. We had no Navy and very little Army. Our central bank, had uh, the charter had expired in 1811, and the Northern merchants are refusing to loan money to the government for the war. And Britain, even though focused on the war in Europe, initially repelled American invasions in Canada, and imposed an effective blockade on the nation's shipping. In 1814, Britain invaded and captured Washington, D.C. and burned the White House. And we attempted to take Canada and failed. English forces took the Great Lakes and began to push back. We did have a few victories. Uh, the defense of Baltimore at Fort McHenry, and well, that had been inspired the song that's going to become our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. And we decisively vanquished the Indian forces in the West and the South, killing Tecumseh and a lot of other militants. But most notably, forces led by Andrew Jackson forced Indians to cede much of the southeastern lands that were going to later become Alabama and Mississippi, and then repulsed the British forces at the Battle of New Orleans in January 1815. The battle was fought after the war had ended, before news reached America that the American and British negotiations had signed the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war the previous month. But the treaty changed nothing, it gave the United States no territory or rights, and there was nothing said about in U.S. ships or impressment. Now, this is supposed to be the picture of the uh, portrait of the taking of the city of Washington and the bombardment of Bal uh, Baltimore's fort. Now, I think I have mentioned to you before, if you ever get a chance to do any kind of research on the president's wife, you've got to pick Abigail Adams or Dolly Madison. Dolly was quite a few years younger than her husband, and she was a party girl. 
Everybody loved to go to the White House because of Dolly, not because of her husband, who was a little short fellow that sucked on the women too much. But it's Dolly who was given credit for saving the Constitution and the uh, Declaration of Independence and a lot of important papers because Madison, this little bitty drink of water, is out on a horse trying to lead the military. He's good at riding, but he's no good at leading an army. And Dolly was left in Washington, so when she saw the British coming, she took off. And another little tidbit. We sometimes can't understand why Americans are so sanctimonious about thinking that they're right and that their way is the best way and that we're God's chosen people. Well, it seems like every time we take a step forward, uh, something good happens. Now, yes, Washington was burned, but not totally because something happened that had never happened before. A hurricane went up the Potomac and it rained so much and the winds blew so hard that it started putting out the fires and it was blowing the soldiers and the cannon of the British all over the place. Now isn't that a sign that God's on your side? Well at least the people took it that way. But this war of 1812 is sometimes called the Second War of Independence. That war affirmed the ability of our republic to defend itself and wage war without sacrificing republican institutions. They made Andrew Jackson a national hero. It sealed the doom of the Indians who occupied the lands east of the Mississippi, thus ensuring a lot of new land opened up for the white settlers, where they're going to go and take their slaves with them. It also, as strange as it may seem, strengthened Americans' and nationalism and their sense of isolation and separation from Europe. We're better than they are. The war sealed the demise of the Federalist Party, which had been briefly revitalized, but it got shot in the foot with that by the Federalists in New England having a convention in Hartford in uh, December of 1814. And some of the things they presented uh, made sense. They wanted to get rid of that three uh, two-fifths votes in Congress for uh, to get rid of the counting the African Americans as three fifths of a person. They wanted two thirds vote in Congress for declaring war to admit new states, and they wanted laws restricting trade. But electrifying victory at New Orleans made Jackson a hero, and it made the Federalists seem a little bit unpatriotic. So within a very few years, the Federalist Party is completely gone. The urban and commercial interests of the party that they represented were small and in a very expanding agrarian nation. And they were a bit elitist. And they didn't trust democracy for the common folks. They became increasingly more and more out of touch with an increasing democratic culture. But the Federalists had raised an issue that would not go away. The domination of the national government by the slave-holding South. And the kind of commercial developments that they championed would soon inaugurate a social and economic transformation of the entire nation. Now, I went on because I had to, it had to have a YouTube there and I took it out and put it in the uh, post chapter 7. I caution you, I know this chapter has been terribly long, but there's been so much going on in it. Uh, listen to the YouTubes after this. Uh, Watch the Founding Fathers. Listen to this. Well, of course, you're listening to this or you wouldn't be hearing this. Skim your chapter. This is a very important chapter. I promise you, I cross my part and promise you that the next two lectures will be very short.